So during the Edo period, the great tradition of Japanese painting, Yamatoi painting, continues in high art, like these screens, these painted screens. And they are, I'm saying here, extraordinarily bold and inventive in terms of these abstract marks, where you simultaneously feel as if you really are at sea, that you're pitching and floating atop a sh on a ship at a wild sea, but you feel disoriented. And then you also feel like these multiple viewpoints are also a flat pattern, where there's this just pattern of arcing green forms, and they make the leaves, and then there's this gold band. So there's a decorative effect, there's an amazing simplicity with with a, balanced with a complexity. This is a great high art tradition, and I call it high art because two panel folding screens like this, gold leaf on paper, gold leaf on paper, this is a unique art object, meaning there's only one, right? This is hand painted, handmade, laborious, inventive, brilliant, cannot be replicated. And so there are visual elements that we can see are also common in kimonos. That's why I'm showing that here, where you have kind of fragmented bits woven into a, a dynamic patterning. But like a kimono, this is something very exquisitely made. And so this is very different from the low art that emerges in the Edo period. Why is it low? It's low because it's cheap, reproducible prints, like posters. So it is not high art, it is not a, a grand, unique art object made for a patron. It's something made for a popular audience, and it's made really to be thrown away. It's also low art because it shows the lowest of the low, the common people. In fact, the people who are most despised in urban Edo. So Haranobu is creating a print titled The Flowers of Beauty in the Floating World because this term, yukiyo-i, the pictures of the floating world, describes the entire culture in which this geisha lives, and it is a description of the artworks. They themselves are pictures of the floating world. They anticipate photography because they are mass-produced images for a popular culture of glamour and desire. Let's think more deeply about that. The geishas are the entertainment ladies or the escorts of Japan's Edo period. The floating world Yukioi, I think that's misspelled there. Those are the red light districts. They were unlicensed. So this, these were illicit parts of the city where you could have certain illicit pleasures, including the pleasure of time with the geisha, who was, although it is often common to kind of glamorize the geishas, and they certainly were good at showing a glamorous facade, they were in fact, in fact, indentured servants of tea shop owners. So their, their working conditions were very difficult. The artworks themselves are prints. And so I'm comparing this print, which is a woodblock print. That's the technique in which this print is made. I'm comparing it to Andy Warhol <laughs> showing Marilyn Monroe in a silk screen. Because Marilyn Monroe was similarly, her job was to be a sex object and to incite fantasies and to get paid for being a kind of fantasy of sexual availability. And so that's her job too. And But in both cases, the image, notice how the face is a kind of mask of glamour, right? With her lipstick and her peroxide hair, similarly with her combed back hair and her lipstick, they are an ideal of beauty that's incredibly artificial. And they are shown here in this kind of fan imagery. And that's to an extent what the pictures of the floating world were. They were sort of fan posters. So woodblock prints, that means 
the, you use a block of wood to carve in your image to allow you to make multiple copies of the image rather than to have one unique artwork as you do with a painting. So print technology had already developed in East Asia by the Song Dynasty. And then it evolved into a standardized multi-step process for mass production. That's the key idea. Mass production means it's a popular art form. It is a low art form. It is not an incredibly rare, exquisite art object for one privileged patron. And so this is a, a, an art form that actually grew in the Edo period out of calendars, illustrated calendars, and in fact, the shogunate, the shoguns controlled the production of calendars. And the first calendars that were produced that were illustrated calendars were actually illegal calendars, too. That's how controlled the society was. And so the technology involved a designer and a publisher, right? So a designer is someone who creates the image. The publisher will, usually makes the bulk of the money that pays the designer. And then... The, there's a person who's an anonymous craftsperson laboring here with the tools to carve the image so you can create grooves essentially where you pour the ink in. And so you have, you know, a labor production process. This is not one artist's personal expression the way Dong Chi Chong thought of it. And so there are important implications involving how the use of woodblock printing as a medium and the audience, the mass audience, who was the intended audience. One implication is that we get serial production. The famous, the most famous artists who made yukiyoi pictures of the floating world are the great H's, Harunobu, Hokusai, and Hiroshiga, all brilliant. And they all worked in series. So Hiroshiga, for instance, made a series called 100 Famous Views of Edo. So 100 Famous Tourist Views, right? These are tourist pictures, but they're the greatest tourist pictures ever made. And the idea is because prints can be made cheaply and abundantly, you can create a kind of a series of a theme, such as the theme of the Edo beautiful spots and you sell them in a series because these were originally used to create calendars so they're not unrelated from the calendar you might have gotten it in um for for the holidays that was you know 12 adorable puppy pictures except they're artistically masterful with this brilliant use of compositional devices such as the, the tree trunk looming right up close, as if we could hit our foreheads on it, with the blossoms in great detail, and then the mountain, the boats, all off in the distance, this play between near and far, that I'm going to talk about how it absolutely dazzles the French painters known as the Impressionists. And so these are subjects that appeal to the chonin, right? These are not subjects that speak to the samurai and their sense of themselves as warriors and preservers of the great heritage of Japan's high culture. These are people who go out on outings to tourist destinations, who go to visit the famous plum orchard when the plum blossoms are beginning to bloom. And they're not just there to see the plum blossoms, they're there to see and be seen amongst each other. And it's marvelous how Hiroshiga has here played with seeing, um, catching a peak where you look through these plum blossom branches to see the distant plum blossoms and the people. This very city consciousness of looking at other people who you don't know, right? This entertaining, um, this entertaining activity of people watching, basically. And so there, these bold compositional designs are fantastically inventive, and they're also full of kind of sly wit about the life in the city. So Horonobu, his favorite subject was the kind of the 
the renowned beauties of the time. You could call them the it girls. That was a phrase used in the 60s. In fact, one was the daughter of a toothpick shop owner who was referred to as the ginkgo girl. That She's here. This is actually the samurai warrior who's flirting with her. Um, and you see her at the tea house with all the imagery that is like the imagery we're looking at. And the idea that this is a world of images, this floating world, where people primp, primp up to flirt and be flirted with, to see and be seen. And so this is actually a scene of one of these gorgeous city girls getting ready for her night out. And I use the word, word girls advisedly. Of course, they're they're women, but this is a culture that's viewing the, the kind of young on the brim of adulthood woman as this sexual object of fascination. And so I'm comparing them again to the idea of the Hollywood movie star with this remote artificial beauty that's alluring, but completely artificial. So these prints in Japan were thought of as kind of throwaway things, sort of like you know, back in the day when you had a newspaper instead of an iPhone with the news on your iPhone, you know, you might use, you might throw away the newspaper or you might use it to wrap some cups that you're boxing up. That's how throwaway these prints were. But in fact, in the 19th century, French artists became madly obsessed with them, completely in love with them because they recognized how brilliant they were. The absolute um, enchantment that was had in France for all things Japanese was called Japanisma. And Impressionist painters like Degas were very interested in the use of space, in kind of playful contrast between one plane and then another plane, and a kind of peekaboo effect. So he's, he literally owned this print interior of a bathhouse and was obviously fascinated by the kind of voyeurism of the print on the screen here that covers up but then exposes the woman washing her crotch and there's actually the bathhouse proprietor spying on her. So there's this voyeuristic theme uh, as well as kind of the fascination of the colors that you get from the kimonos, the green, the gold, those kind of bold, strong colors that wind up having their own kind of rhythmic value as pure abstract ornamentation. Van Gogh was also so impressed by Japanese prints that he himself had a copy of Hiroshiga's Plum Orchard and copied it into oil on canvas. And he actually created kind of like fake Japanese because he didn't know Japanese, but he really wanted to kind of immerse himself in the feeling of Japanese art. And he understood the relationship of text to picture that was so is so important in this tradition. So the third great unforgettable, absolutely un, unmatched master of printmaking is Hokusai. And this print, The Great Wave, is one of the most famous artworks in the world. It's one of those artworks like the Mona Lisa, Lisa I meant to say, that is a kind of icon of artistic achievement. But it is itself actually part of a series, 36 Views of Mount Fuji. And so the wonderful thing about this series is that Mount Fuji pops up and pops out in different locations, in different seasons. And this is closely related to another series he did, Waters in Their Thousand Aspects. I mean, what a brilliant theme for someone from Japan, right? We talked about Japan being an island nation, a nation of islands. So this idea of water as the boundary and the element that is always surrounding you and to explore it, which is such a hard thing to do in, in woodblock printing because that's a, a, a you know, you, you carve into wood to make these lines and then you pour ink. How do you get the fluidity of water? Well, he did. So he is so brilliant that you are going to watch a wonderful film about him because he is an artist that it is just, first of all, such a joy to listen to what he had to say, to see more of his work. But also he's an artist that you must know if you want to know Asian art, the way you must know Van Gogh if you want to know European art. And there are some artists that you should know intimately. And Hokusai is one of them.